uh, I'll just give some context uh, for what I will talk about. Um, uh, Guillaume and Ted asked me to focus on uh, the incentives uh, that are changing and how we might uh, change practices uh, in social sciences. Uh, so I will focus uh, on that. And as I was starting pr to prepare uh, the talk, I was thinking I should set up the problem, but then I realized I was following John and assumed that he would be sufficiently terrifying uh, to not have to actually address the problem. And, and he followed through. That was completely terrifying. Uh, so I, I won't spend any time uh, on that, but rather jump uh, right to uh, how we are, uh, the context of, of what things are changing and how uh, we can continue to change uh, our practices. Uh, not yet. I might just pull it out. Oh, yeah, here we go. There it is. Good, thank you. Uh, so the context that we have is uh, a good one in terms of opportunity because there, uh, there is a lot of consistency with what the values of science are uh, and uh, how people would like uh, to behave. And that is evident uh, in a number of lines of research. But one of my favorite examples of that is work that was done uh, by Anderson and her colleagues in surveying early and mid-career researchers. They sampled 3,500 or so uh, people who were just at the postdoc or slightly after postdoc stage for uh, early career uh, and then mid-career people around age 40 at the stage of their first R01 uh, awards. Uh, and they surveyed them on their uh, evaluation of the, the norms of science following Robert Mer Merton's norms uh, and also a few other uh, additional ones that have come through him. Uh, since uh, his work. Uh, for example, do you value uh, transparency uh, or the counter norm, secrecy? Uh, do you val value um, evaluating the research on its own merit uh, or do you prefer to evaluate uh, based on the reputation of the person that generated that research? Uh, do you value openness uh, and skepticism towards all work or do you value dogmatism and protection of uh, your own theories, et cetera, like that? Uh, and what they found is that across these different norms, what I'm showing you here is a cumulative distribution, zero to 100%. Uh, and in the light gray uh, are people who valued, on average, the norms over the counter norms uh, of science. Uh, and in black are people who valued the counter norms over the norms and hatched are about equal valuing. Uh, transparency valued just as much as secrecy across the various norms they asked. So then they followed up and say, okay, so you have uh, these values, you hold uh, these two, you want to be uh, doing uh, transparent research. So don't tell me what you value, tell me what you do uh, in your everyday work. Uh, and the responses shift to some degree. So now about 60% uh, or so of early and mid-career researchers say, I do follow uh, in my daily practice the norms uh, of science uh, and a few, few more, but still very small percentages uh, saying they favor the counter norms uh, over the norms. And then they said, fine, fine, that's great. Uh, don't tell me what you do. Tell me what other people uh, do in your discipline. Uh, and this is what they observed. Uh, a complete reversal of strong skepticism of the everyday researcher that is not me uh, in terms of their motivations and practices in doing science. Uh, and for any behavioral research intervention, the gap between the top of what people value is what they would like to do, how they think science ought to operate, and the bottom, how they think the world around them is operating, is a very large perception gap of what the norms are for value versus the norms are for practice. Uh, and that is a very difficult situation to perform in because one wants to survive and thrive in the discipline of science. But if you feel like everyone else is doing it in a way that just advantages themselves but disadvantages the quality of science, it's very hard to move to new practices. And so, uh, one of the advantages this, that this distribution poses for uh, trying to uh, implement change is that people are prepared for change. They want to do the things toward the ideals. They just aren't incentivized right now to do them. And so incentives can leverage those values uh, in order to motivate broader change more rapidly. And so the approach that we have to this, which is common to many of the other groups uh, that are working on this, uh, is, uh, is threefold. Uh, the first is to try to develop technologies to enable uh, people to change. Uh, it's fine to have the values, but if you don't have tools that make it easy, efficient, and effective, 
uh, to behave in a more transparent fashion, uh, then the opportunity costs of having to spend the time to prepare my data uh, for sharing, finding a place to put it, doing all the extra work after publication, which is where I finished, right? I'm done, I've achieved my reward, uh, so now why would I do extra work that isn't valued? Uh, if I don't have the tools that make it a lot easier to do it, then I'm unlikely uh, to adopt that new practice. Uh, also, we need training. This is a big part of what BITS is doing, is people may have those values but not actually know what to do in practice. When I'm confronted with, okay, I want to pre-register my research and define my analysis plan, how do I do that? Uh, when we sit down and actually start to work on it, we may realize that we actually don't have the fundamentals of how one can do this in a strong confirmatory fashion. What I usually do when I analyze my data is I have my data and I sit down and I start to figure out how to analyze my data by analyzing my data. Uh, and of course, when you're confronted with, nope, you don't get to have your data yet, uh, then you have to figure out an entirely new uh, model for how it is you actually prepare and do it. Uh, and then finally uh, is the key for what I'll focus on today, which are the incentives to embrace change. We may have the values, we may have the tools available, uh, we may have the knowledge for how to do it, but if those practices aren't valued in terms of career outcomes, in terms of satisfaction outcomes, in terms of things that actually help me uh, as a scientist, then I'm unlikely to adopt those practices. And so if we don't attend to all three of these, then we're not likely to uh, be able to implement change even when it's change that would be more aligned uh, with our daily values. And so what we know about incentives is that they're not just coming from a single source in science. Science is a complex ecosystem. There are many different players that are uh, each contributing in a different way to how the science is operating. And each of them are both subject to and reinforcing those incentives that prioritize the value of publication over accuracy for my reward uh, and advancement in scientific research. So if we don't take a full ecosystem approach to thinking about how these incentives are interacting with one another, uh, we won't be able to make uh, change. Uh, so there, that's context. Uh, the positive, very positive, I think, thing to note over the last few years that BITS and many other groups have played a very important role in doing, uh, focusing on the social sciences, because there's much happening, as John described, in other disciplines. Uh, but in the social sciences, there is evidence that change is already occurring. Uh, and a lot of that is coming from the grassroots of people just saying, no, it's important enough to me to try to do this, even if it's not directly in my values uh, or in my reward structures, that I just, this is how I want to behave as a scientist. And this is only one indicator uh, of this, but the indicator that we have readily available to us is adoption of the open science framework uh, for people to manage their own research and make it available to others. Uh, so as of yesterday, there, this, you know, we will open this uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, there's 7,100 uh, users that are registered on the OSF. Uh, just in 2014, it's an average of 14.2 more per day. Uh, th those users have created 7,400 projects. About 25% of those are made public. Uh, you're allowed to use it entirely privately if you like uh, and make just parts or all of it public uh, if you like. Uh, and there are more than 1,200 registrations uh, of the projects uh, that are being done, uh, and some of those uh, registrations being kept private. You have the option to register it privately and then release it if you're worried about being scooped uh, later. Uh, and then recognizing the time lag, only 20, a, little, a few over 20 of those. It's hard to count because we don't have a uh, scraper yet to find out every registered study that's published in the literature, but we know of a few more than 20 uh, that have been published in print. Uh, there's other indicators of change. So, for example, Yuri and Leif and some others uh, uh, created a paragraph that reviewers can decide that they would just want to put uh, in their reviews. Uh, so I don't have control over the entire ecosystem that I operate in, but I am a reviewer, and so I do can have some impact, even if the journal doesn't uh, have particular policies in place. I can have an impact of what I think is important uh, that needs to be uh, in a review. Uh, and so... Uh, one of the OSF projects has this uh, paragraph that invites uh, any reviewer that wants to just insert that as a matter of policy or a matter of standard practice to every review that they write uh, to ask for particular things for disclosure. Uh, so a very much a grassroots effort uh, on increasing transparency. And so I now see these every once in a while in papers that I review, not just that I put it in, but others uh, put it in as well. Uh, so that's, th these are just small indicators that uh, the community is doing some of these things themselves. 
Then there's also nice evidence of things happening uh, from the top down or people that have levers uh, to help promote change. So AEA, APS, and APASA are all uh, initiating activities uh, that will increase transparency uh, in their respective disciplines. Uh, AEA has uh, strong data sharing standards now. Uh, Pre-registration is emerging uh, in economics, particularly for AER. Uh, APS has been uh, experimenting uh, and implementing a number of new practices. Bobby's uh, journal uh, does registered reports now, many different laboratories replicating a, a single study uh, that has important value to get a more precise estimate of the effects. Uh, APSA uh, was involved in, and continues to be involved in the DART initiative that Skip and others uh, have been promoting uh, across uh, political science uh, disciplines. I think that's going to be discussed tomorrow too, right? Yeah, so you'll hear more about that tomorrow. Uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation and the Arnold Foundation are uh, adopting uh, policies and standards for data sharing, data access, open access uh, of the research that gets produced, of things that they fund, and there are many others doing that. Welcome Trust has done a lot uh, in that, more in the biomedical domain. Uh, NSF, the SBE uh, directorate, uh, had a, uh, a meeting a number of months ago uh, from which I, I think any day now, I keep hearing any day now and every day, uh, that there will be a report issued from that about uh, some uh, transparency standards that NSF will promote uh, across the social and behavioral sciences. Uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy is, uh, has already an, uh, uh, sent out some uh, initiative announcements trying to promote uh, greater data access and is preparing uh, to do more. Uh, and NIH has gotten very involved uh, in doing this. So many different groups uh, are promoting change. Uh, in other ways. Uh, the role that we are trying to help uh, in this, uh, this broad array of efforts is to foster uh, communities around particular products and services or activities. Uh, and so the, the component that, that we are trying to contribute with that is helping to find people across disciplines uh, that are interested in a common core theme. Uh, what should be disclosed? Uh, what kind of way, you know, what can we do in terms of forming a checklist uh, or a particular standard uh, for what needs to be reported for particular kinds of designs, uh, and then provide some resources and an information commons uh, for gathering the information of what practices have been done, uh, what standards might be produced, uh, and how that might be maintained uh, and expanded over time, uh, and then provide uh, some resources in order to continually evaluate the effect of implementing some of these new practices. Uh, and iterate and use the information that we gain from actually practicing with new practices uh, in terms of trying to refine them and improve, improve them over time. Uh, so these are open communities in the sense that we're trying to, just as, as BITS uh, is really promoting as a grassroots effort, is the community can do a lot of the things itself because we recognize very readily from our daily experience uh, what the challenges are uh, for doing effective research, what the barriers are uh, for adopting more transparent practices, and what we might do uh, to try to make it easier uh, for myself uh, to do those practices, and then perhaps others uh, would want to do them as well. So I just want to give a couple of examples uh, in terms of progress report uh, for some of these incentive shifts uh, that are being adopted uh, in, in sort of starter cases, but perhaps will be expanding more broadly. Uh, one of them, uh, because the values are there, is uh, a very effective means of behavior change is just to signal when that behavior is happening. Right now, it's very hard to notice when someone makes their data or their materials available or when they pre-register their design uh, because there isn't an obvious thing uh, that happens. Uh, you might have to actually read the paper and maybe it has it in a footnote that they did something like that, uh, but it may be totally disconnected. None of the papers that I published in the 10 years prior uh, to 2012 had the link to the Dataverse component where those data are stored, even though I made those data available, because I made the data available afterwards. I hadn't been thinking I was going to make the data available then. So the, the data, its existence, uh, and the publication about them are completely disconnected, uh, making it much harder to discover. Well, badges are an easy way to signal uh, that these behaviors are occurring. So journals can adopt badges uh, for open data, open materials, pre-registration. 
uh, and then signal, one, that the journal cares about such things, that it is worthwhile to do these. And so the, ba the badges are offered as an option to authors uh, to get because the journal thinks these are things that are worth getting. Uh, and then they're also a signal for authors that care enough to want to do those things. Whether they're rewarded for it or not, some people may just want to do it. Uh, and so signaling that this paper does in fact have its data available or its materials available is a means for someone to get some acknowledgement for doing that extra work. Uh, and then might be a means for a reader to evaluate uh, that work, whether they think that's relevant or not to how they evaluate it. Uh, and so this is very much an open campaign in the sense that it doesn't require anybody to do anything. Uh, it just provides opportunity to share information, make it more available uh, what, is at, what behaviors are actually occurring. So journals don't take any risk by adopting because if nobody in their discipline cares about such things, then no one will apply to earn the badges and there will be no harm uh, spent. Uh, if, journal, if authors don't care about it, then they don't have to do the effort to do it, and so they don't get the badges. Uh, so, but as a signaling mechanism, it can be very effective. So Psychological Science sends out TWIPs this week in Psychological Science every week to my in email inbox, uh, and it has a little signal there. These are the three badges that Psychological Science op offers, uh, and then each paper has those badges uh, right next to it. And the role that we play at the center is, the, is trying to provide the infrastructure for maintaining those badges. So the badges can be baked, uh, baked with the issuer of the receiver, uh, what it was received for, uh, a permanent identifier like a DOI. Uh, all of the information about what the badge is can be part of the digital, uh, the digital image so that it is a digital, digitally readable object and can be aggregated and otherwise easily and verified that in fact it was issued and who issued it. Uh, so psychological science adopted the badges uh, at the beginning of 2014 uh, and just made it available if authors cared to uh, want to apply for these, they would be able to. Uh, and there was very little uh, knowledge about whether anyone would care to apply. Uh, but this is a summary of where it, is, where it stands with psychological science through the, the 11 months uh, that have gone by. So about 140 articles have been accepted uh, during this time period, uh, this 11 months or so. Uh, about 36 of them applied for one or more of the badges. So about 25% uh, of uh, authors applied for a badge and 32 of those uh, were awarded at least one badge. The way in which they're awarded is that the, the community, the cause community that maintains these badges uh, has written specifications for what does it take uh, to earn an open data badge. Uh, and then the author just has to confirm that in fact they've met those criteria in order to earn that badge, and then the journal awards that uh, by putting it on uh, the article itself. Uh, so in terms of the rate, I don't know what to have expected, but uh, I didn't expect 20% would in the first year. Uh, and uh, to, so to me, that's, that's pretty good. People have done none of it uh, the prior year, and now 20% uh, are doing it. And so whether that grows over time in terms of a norm having some influence is, is an open question. Uh, but the community, uh, you can see the, the people uh, listed there are, are, in, are folks that are contributing to the specifications and the maintenance of that. Uh, and then we are, uh, there are eight journals so far that have uh, committed uh, to adopting the badges. Uh, and that's across a few different disciplines, but mostly in psychology uh, at this point. Uh, and so the, there, it will be interesting uh, to, as we gain experience to have an information comments about the rates uh, of adoption and means with which we can further specify uh, what it means uh, to earn a badge. And there's lots of suggestions that the committee is fielding uh, for additional badges or refinements uh, to the specifications for the badges that are occurring. Uh, a second incentive change that, uh, that a committee uh, community is work, has been working on with, with some success this year is registered reports. And so here's the cartoon version of how research gets done. You design a study, you collect and analyze data, you report it, and you publish it. Uh, but of course, there is a barrier, uh, and that is the peer review process, that once the report is written, uh, then peer review is the means of preventing me from getting the reward that I want, which is the publication. Uh, and of course, all the incentives with peer review at this stage being only a barrier to my reward uh, all of the incentives are to making that report as beautiful uh, as possible so that it passes through uh, the peer evaluation process. Uh, and so the accuracy versus publication incentive is very strong for me when I'm confronted with this scenario uh, because I know that positive results are more likely to get published than negative results. 
I know that novel results are more likely to get published than replications. I know uh, that clean results are more likely to get published than results where a couple of the outcome measures didn't quite line up with the, uh, with the main story. Uh, and so because I know all of those things, the decisions that I make in the analysis and reporting phase uh, may be shaped by that knowledge. Even if I don't want it to be, even if I'm trying to do uh, the best job that I can, I may nonetheless uh, find myself with a very beautiful package that is a product of my extremely good rationalization process for narrowing down to those subsets of things that look best uh, for publication rather than are best uh, for accuracy. So registered reports makes one simple change, and that's to move peer review uh, to after the design phase. Before any outcomes have been observed, uh, perhaps before data collection occurs, in some cases you can imagine data collection occurring and still doing this process, before you know what the results are, peer review happens. So you submit to a journal that has adopted registered reports, uh, and they conduct a full peer review about the design of the research. Is the method a uh, quality method? Is the question an important and interesting question? Uh, is the test an effective test? Is there a plan for analysis, an effective analysis plan? And if it passes that peer review at whatever stringency the journal decides to adopt, uh, then they give a in principle acceptance. If you follow through with the feedback that the editorial team has given you uh, in terms of what needs to happen in that research for it to be published, uh, then we will publish it regardless of outcome, whether the results are positive or negative. So my incentives with this are to design the best study possible in order to get the most likely in principle acceptance. Uh, the reviewers are also have the same incentive. Make sure this is the best test possible of that question uh, and if it's a low power test, I'm going to say, this is too low power. You're not going to get enough information. It won't be a precise estimate. So don't do that kind of a study. Uh, or if it's a crazy idea that wouldn't it be crazy if this happened, then they would say, well, get some pilot evidence that that actually might happen and then come back with a confirmatory study uh, in order to test it rather than the right now, which is just do as much crazy stuff as possible and hope a few of them uh, hit. Uh, so the, and then this is particularly good for when there are theoretical or conceptual debates uh, among different people uh, about a particular problem because they don't know what the outcome is. They get to have their debate in the review process about how the study should be conducted in order to find out what occurs. And then whatever the outcome, uh, it will be published. And then people, of course, will find reasons, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't mention the fact that you using mails on Tuesdays is not the way uh, to do this kind of research. But of course, that wouldn't be something you would do in this work. Uh, but nonetheless, getting those commitments up front uh, can change uh, incentives dramatically for accuracy. Uh, and this uh, approach, the committee uh, is chaired by Chris Chambers, uh, who is a neuroscientist, has been very active uh, in recruiting uh, journals and providing uh, a lot of information about how registered reports can be done effectively. Uh, and there are 15 or so journals uh, that have adopted uh, this as a complementary model uh, to uh, peer review as it normally occurs. So there's only one journal that has uh, said all of our publishing is going to occur uh, via this approach, registered reports, and that's Comprehensive res Results uh, in Social Psychology, CRSP. Uh, that's a brand new journal that they uh, designed, Kai Jonas uh, uh, and Joe Cesario uh, designed the journal to be exclusively a registered reports journal, uh, and so that's just getting off the ground now. Uh, we had a special issue of Social Psychology that came out in May uh, that was 15 registered reports uh, all in, this case, in that case, all replications uh, of prominent research uh, in the field, uh, and uh, that generated a, a good deal of interest and a lot of experience with how uh, this kind of model can operate. And what's uh, very nice about this, uh, these kinds of community-based approaches is that there's, there's a lot of independent actors across a lot of different disciplines that want to try it out but have their own ideas of different variations. And so because this isn't policy directive from above, it's just community doing it for community's sake, uh, we can be very tolerant of the variations that different groups pursue for how they implement registered reports. So I'm showing you just a subset here uh, of this spreadsheet. But you can, if you go to the website, uh, you can find this spreadsheet of all of the different variations across the journals that have adopted this so far. There's 19 different uh, criteria that are listed in the columns uh, for how registered reports could be implemented. And so all of them have slightly different approaches to it. And as an information commons, the community 
uh, will uh, gather some evaluation criteria. How is it that it, each of, it's going in each of these disciplines? Uh, and then provide a feedback mechanism back to those journals and then to whichever other journals that are considering it in order to try to improve uh, the process of operating the uh, registered reports. Okay, so those are two examples of some uh, activities underway to try to shift some of the incentives. Uh, there are a few others uh, that are uh, actively in development now or conceptually in development that are worth mentioning just as sort of the next steps for the, the things that we're trying to help with. Uh, and if you have others, uh, we will be very glad to hear about them. Uh, but one is uh, trying to promote how journals can uh, adopt practices. What should they adopt as their guidelines? Uh, there are many journal editors that have said, I'm, I'm prepared to do things. I'm convinced by the problems. I saw John's talk, and I'm totally frightened. Uh, and so now I want to do something. But what should I do? Uh, and so with uh, BITS and Science Magazine, Ted mentioned this in his opening, uh, we hosted a meeting uh, at the center uh, just a, a month or so ago uh, in order to try to identify uh, what would be best practices, or at least good practices, uh, for promoting transparency uh, and reproducibility uh, for journals. And so the, uh, the team, there were five committees uh, that did a lot of work uh, before the meeting and came with proposals to the meeting for everybody. There was a number of journal editors and other uh, people in the discipline. Uh, tr what would be ways uh, to try to promote transparency and present it? And then the committees went through revisions uh, based on the feedback. Uh, and right now we are at the stage, these are the um, four areas uh, of discussion that the committees did. There were two different committees uh, on disclosure standards. Uh, but there, right now, the, there is a consolidation phase. So we've received the final revisions uh, of those different uh, proposals from the different committees uh, based on all the feedback. And we're trying to get it to us an aggregate document uh, of what are some good practices. And what emerged from this discussion, which was particularly benefited by the fact that there were people from different disciplines uh, in the social sciences, was the fact that there are different kinds of challenges and different openness to solutions uh, across different disciplines. So data sharing uh, is still very difficult uh, in psychology, but is not at all difficult to the same degree in economics. And so what that suggested uh, to the collected committee uh, was that uh, we need to meet disciplines where they are, but also point a path to what ultimate outcomes there could be. So rather than a singular, uh, this is good practice for data sharing, uh, the committees have come up with proposals for levels. Uh, what's a level one step? From where you are now, what's one thing you can do uh, to sort of encourage more data sharing? Uh, rather than I'm not going to require it of all of my authors because I would kill my journal if I did that, an editor might say. Uh, then what's a level two and what's a level three? And so you give sort of a bronze, silver, and gold uh, rating for what journals might adopt uh, for transparency practices and then let journal editors decide which of these am I willing to stick my neck out on because I think all of these things are big risks uh, for their editorhood. Uh, so that's one. Uh, a second is that by defining those standards for good practices, we now have a template for journal scorecards. Uh, so we can start thinking about incentives for journals to be highly rated on transparency and reproducibility practices uh, for their guidelines. So I see PSR, George Alter uh, and others there uh, have been very interested in this. So we are starting to work together on defining uh, some scorecard mechanisms to incentivize and promote uh, those journals that are pursuing uh, and have adopted uh, extra standards uh, for transparency and openness. Because it's also often, especially in a transitional phase like this, it's also extra work for the journal and the editors of that journal. Uh, so they don't have incentives to adopt new practices in terms of the immediate rewards. They're just doing it because they think it's important to do. So having some acknowledgment of those editors that are taking extra steps uh, is a very good thing. And then a third thing that has not had any, as far as we're aware, systematic discussion or information gathering uh, for how the where where some of the most the strongest incentives are for driving individual researchers' behavior, are university hiring and tenure uh, decisions. Uh, each university has its own idiosyncratic uh, way in which it has either policies or not uh, for how it hires and how it decides whether to tenure or not uh, assistant faculty, professor faculty, uh, and so it would be very useful at minimum to understand what those actual policies or standards are 
uh, and then pr provide a means of sharing information about what possible uh, ways in which that might incentivize behavior that isn't ideal uh, for knowledge accumulation and other alternatives that might be more ideal. Uh, so one example of that would be uh, if the policy implies or says explicitly that the more publications you have and in the more higher outlets they are, uh, the better, then you're incentivizing as a university uh, productivity by volume. Uh, just promote, push out as much as you can uh, and try to get into the highest outlet. If instead the tenure process was produce how much you want, but we're going to evaluate, we're in fact, we're going to actually read three of the articles uh, that you produce uh, for your tenure review. And if I know that when I walk in the door that it's three articles that they're going to read, then my behavior might be a little bit different uh, in terms of how it is I make sure that I nail three effects uh, and get those really good before the tenure review process rather than just trying to push out volume. Okay, so let me close uh, because I am at time uh, with just uh, noting that the, uh, as we discussed at the beginning, the, the ecosystem of incentives is not going to change individually on its own. And so there's uh, many encouraging uh, elements of progress uh, that are occurring from the bottom up, right, of researchers deciding themselves to make these changes, individual journals deciding to make changes. Uh, and all of that will accumulate to uh, more slowly because it is a broad uh, change, uh, but it will be a much, it will be a comprehensive change in the sense that if you can shift the norms for all, then all of the norms are shifted. Uh, and so that provides a mean to enact uh, those norms and the values uh, that researchers have. Uh, but simultaneously, there is a number of the top-down things, the advantage of the top-down approaches of funders uh, and societies or journals uh, implementing particular changes is that they can occur very quickly, uh, but they only address a single slice of the workflow uh, because I'm not funded by all, uh, not all of the work I do is funded by a particular uh, funder or all, any funders. Uh, and th so the, the top-down approaches can promote the norms, uh, but without the bottom-up, uh, those norms won't be enacted uh, in daily practice. Uh, so I will end with that and thank you uh, for your attention and acknowledge all the members of the CAUSE team for their contributions to all of this work. So thank you.